continuing our lessons on protein structure in chapter 4. In this lesson we want to look at primary and secondary structure of proteins. Let's do a brief overview of protein structure. We find there are at least three and possibly four levels of protein structure. The first or primary structure is simply the sequence of amino acids and of course these are joined together by peptide bonds, very strong covalent bonds. Secondary structure forms as we start to form hydrogen bonds between backbone atoms. Finally we have the tertiary structure, that's the final fold of the protein and that's held together by a combination of hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, disulfide bonds, and van der Waals forces. In other words, these are the possibilities. All proteins have at least these three levels of structure. There's a fourth level, quaternary structure, but that is true only for those proteins that have more than one polypeptide chain. That represents the three-dimensional arrangement of those separate chains. These tend to be held together by stronger forces, combinations of ionic bonds, van der Waals forces, and disulfide bonds. So let's look first at that peptide bond. We'll see that this represents our first constraint on the conformation of that protein. Remember we have some resonance here. We have a lone pair on that nitrogen. It can donate an electron to share with that carbon and so we form a partial double bond with that carbon atom. Remember, if it's partially double bonded, the two atoms are closer together, that means a shorter bond length and a stronger bond. This means there's no free rotation around that carbon-nitrogen bond and that is our first constraint on our protein conformation. The atoms in the peptide bond are strongly polar because of those electron withdrawing groups and so there's a strong tendency to form hydrogen bonds with one another. We'll see how that works in just a minute. The chain will fold so that it makes as many of those hydrogen bonding contacts as possible. That will make it more stable and remember that means it will fold up spontaneously. But still we have to minimize steric strain. Let's illustrate what we're talking about. What we have illustrated at the top here is simply the backbone atoms. The side chains have been removed for simplicity. So here we have our central alpha carbon. Here's our peptide group here in our green box. The peptide bond is that red line. And remember, we can't twist the box within itself, but we can turn those boxes relative to one another around that alpha carbon. But still, there's a constraint. If we attempt to overtwist them, then there's some steric hindrance of those residues. So that's our second constraint. We have to consider the steric hindrance if we overtwist around that alpha carbon. So we want to look at the types of secondary structure that form. The first is the alpha helix. Here the peptide backbone is round around a long axis core. It forms a rigid cylinder, a right-handed helix, that's in the counterclockwise direction, and in this case the side chains radiate outward from the helix. I'll illustrate what I mean in just a minute. Now in order to form those hydrogen bonding contacts there's about three and a half amino acids in a full turn, that is 360 degree turn of that helix. Again that has to do with the nature of those hydrogen bonds. So the hydrogen bond donor is going to be the nitrogen in the peptide bond and the hydrogen bond acceptor will be the carbonyl group. Notice it's going to be the nitrogen of one amino acid with the carbonyl oxygen of the fourth amino acid. We're going to illustrate that in just a minute. As far as the prevalence, about 25 percent of all amino acids in globular proteins are represented as alpha helices. So here's a little bit better representation of our alpha helix on the right and you can see the helical nature here, kind of a ribbon look to it. This is our ball and stick model. So here's our first carbon here. This is the carbonyl group. Notice the linear arrangement with the hydrogen atom and here's our nitrogen on our fourth carbon. Notice because it's carbon 1 and carbon 4 you have a linear arrangement to that hydrogen bond and remember that means maximum overlap and very strong interactions. If we tried to form a hydrogen bond with the third carbon, say, or the fifth carbon, we couldn't get that same linear overlap. And that's why it's always carbon 1 with carbon 4, and because of that, we have 3.5 amino acids in one full turn. That keeps our hydrogen bonding interactions linear and very strong. 
Now look at the left. If we look down the helical axis, you can see the white spheres are the backbone atoms and the green spheres are the R groups. So you can see the R groups radiate outwardly. So let's think about why that's true. Remember, we want to form those hydrogen bonding contacts and maximize those interactions, so we need a regular structure. But if we point our R groups on the inside, remember they have different dimensions and so we'd have a very crooked helix. That wouldn't work at all. So in order to form those regular hydrogen bonding contacts, we're going to maintain a regular helical structure and point our R groups outward. The second type of patterned structure that we see in secondary structure is a beta sheet. This is a linear extended, it's called a zigzag pleated sheet and they're formed also by hydrogen bonds, always the backbone atoms, but you can see a linear array in this case to form those hydrogen bonding con contacts. You can see a little bit better why it's called a zigzag pleated sheet if you look at the side view at the, at the bottom of the figure here. You can see it's not a planar arrangement. Now we can arrange those in one of two ways. We can arrange those chains N to C terminus of one with the N to C terminus of another, in other words, a parallel arrangement. In our ribbon diagram, we represent those beta strands as arrows, and you can see the arrows are pointing in the same direction in a parallel arrangement. In contrast, we have anti-parallel, that is, N to C of one chain, hydrogen bonds with C to end of an adjacent chain. In that case, notice our arrows are oppositely oriented for the anti-parallel arrangement. Can you see why the anti-parallel arrangement is more stable? In this case, notice we have a linear arrangement in those hydrogen bonds, whereas for the parallel strands, they're somewhat angled, so not as strong, not as stable. In our next lesson, we want to see, now that we formed primary and secondary structure, how do they adopt a stable three-dimensional conformation? We saw certain motifs or themes in secondary structure. Are there any such things for tertiary structure?